Full disclosure, I did practically absolutely nothing this year for the organization, so thank all the other people besides me. But uh, yeah, I work at some of these companies. Uh, some people call it work. Uh, I do things. Uh, there's actually a bug on this slide, but we don't have time to figure it out. Um, we're going to talk about uh, race conditions. We're going to talk about all of the unsafe things that live under the world that we were learned about in the last talk. This is like the nitty gritty, close to the hardware uh, unicorns and rainbows where you don't expect them and compiler crashes and blah, blah, talk, right? And so uh, I was originally going to talk about threading and then I realized everybody's probably seen talks about threading and all the other talks about threading are better than mine. So uh, we're not going to talk about threading. You theoretically can have you know, parallel threads. They can execute at different times. They can execute and relieved. They can execute and relieve differently. Don't do that. Uh, use the synchronization primitives, at least at work, at home, do whatever you want. Um, this talk is about race conditions, but not about that, right? Um, I mean, if we look at the, the world that we're living in, right? We have a compiler, and it makes my program. And my program, at least if it's a command line program, probably just talks to libc. I mean, libc is basically the adopter pattern for the world outside of the C++ object model, the C++ memory model, and whatnot, right? So whenever the compiler has to do something dangerous, it probably just calls libc or a syscall. And so we want to look at the world sort of beyond that hygienic world up there where it says my program, maybe my program is the operating system, right? Maybe my program is libc. Well, how do I do it then, right? And I've done talks in the past about volatile, just to kind of give you guys a, a little more of a feeling for how I'm abstracting the world here. Volatile lives exclusively in the compiler, right? Um, I mean, with, with uh, uh, um, race conditions and uh, memory order stuff and whatnot, we have certain worlds where different things can live, right? We have compiler reordering, where it says, well, you're touching this memory and that memory, and if I change the order, I can just use one local variable. And since those are not the same thing, then I can do that, right? And Volatile says, no, you can't. That's all Volatile says, and it's relatively weakly defined, right? So that lives just in the compiler world. It doesn't say anything about uh, bus matrices being faster or slower than each other on the hardware. The compiler doesn't know anything about that, and it shouldn't, right? It has its object model, it has its memory model, and that's the contract that you program against, right? And so, Interrupt service routines don't work so well in that world, right? Because with interrupt service routines, um, they have to be really fast, and not as amortized runtime fast, but as when the interrupt happens, you have to get the processor very soon, right? Because it could be a very, very time critical thing that's happening there, right? Everybody thinks airbag, but airbag, you've got like milliseconds. I mean, it could be even faster than that that you need, right? So the unique thing about interrupt service routines, as opposed to threads, is each thread has its own stack. But as an interrupt service routine, you run on someone else's stack, right? You share. And we all have this vision of what sharing looks like, right? And what kids look like, for that matter. My kids don't look like this when sharing ice cream. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, so what does it mean sharing stack, right? Like, you know, we have, maybe we have a threading model on our, on our system, maybe we're running an embedded RTOS, or maybe we're actually programming a kernel or whatever. If the blue thread's up, then the interrupt series of teams gonna run on the blue thread stack. It's just gonna go on top of it, right? And then depending on which thread's running, at that exact moment that the interrupt comes, it's gonna run on that thread stack. And so it has to run to completion. Because if it doesn't, and it defers back to the thread that it stole the stack from, then what if that thread calls a function? It'll just overwrite my stack, right? Because the stack may need to grow. So, so I have to run until I'm done, and then I can go back, right? 
And we have this same uh, concept with uh, the kernel developer people, and they call them signals, right? So this is more of a kid sharing, you know, realistic thing. And there's actually semantic value to this picture because the newer one wins. <laughs> <laughs> right, so signals run on the stack of the thread that they are interrupting in the operating system, and they don't wait, so they win every resource contention, right? They just get it, because what else are you going to do? You can't wait till the thread on whose stack you are unlocks a mutex. That's going to be forever, right? And so you have to win. And so this is kind of an interesting inversion of uh, a, a um, you know, locked uh, programming where, you know, the one who's second waits. Well, we can't do that. We have to have the one that's second to the resource. That one has to win. And so we automatically need commit and rollback semantics, right? Because if you started, how do you know if you're going to be interrupted, right? And I never understood why syscalls conspiracy fail in the past. This is why syscalls conspiracy fail, right? Like you call a system function and it'll just return to you, yeah, I couldn't do it. Some some operating system code for, yeah, I, I don't know why I couldn't. And you just do it again and then it works. I'm like, couldn't it have just done that the first time? No, this is why, because there was this, a, a signal which interrupted the kernel while that syscall was running. And it has to win, because how else are you going to do it, right? So we're going to look a little bit at how we can program in this model. And this is getting back into the uh, I do all my own stunts thing. So uh, use with caution. Um, ARM Cortex cores have load exclusive and store exclusive instructions. Um, this is also called linked load semantics. I don't know why. I mean, engineers are bad at naming things. But uh, who here has used or heard of this? Okay, a third of the room, good crowd. Um, the semantics are with the load exclusive, okay, you know, you have a address of a register and then you get the contents of that register, but some circuit in the processor remembers that you loaded that thing, right? And so when you want to go and store it, then your store could fail, and that's why you have two, uh, that's why you have a return of a store. I mean, usually you don't return anything from a store, but in this case, your store returns, true or false, if you succeeded in storing. And you succeed in storing if you were the last one to read, right? And so um, we can use this uh, to make uh, um, block free queues that work in this model actually incredibly efficiently, right? So any, any you know, any multi-producer queue that's atomic is gonna have to be some kind of linked list. I'm not sure there's any other implementation possibility there. If it's a single producer, single consumer, you can make a ring buffer and two pointers chase each other, right? But if you have multiple consumers, which, you know, in my world is you have multiple interrupt priorities, right? One interrupt priority could interrupt the other interrupt, and they both want to push to the queue, right? And you can actually implement that relatively cheaply if you have, you know, a pointer to the first node, that's the orange one, right? And here we have some nodes just on the, on, in, in the queue already. It's a singly linked list. And we have some interrupt that wants to push a node onto the queue. And then we have another interrupt that also wants to push a node onto the queue. Right? And each one of them can load the orange one to see where the next node is, right? Or the first node, as it were. And then can point to that thing. Maybe the other one loads it and points to that thing. But when they want to update the base, I mean, this looks like it's a problem, but it's not a problem yet because no one else can see it. Both of these nodes are, you know, local uh, uh, variables, right? And so no one else can find the, 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 the log jam here, right? And so when I want to store, one of them will win. They can't both win, right? And so the second one, when it tries to store, the upper one, 
it will get a, I couldn't do it, right? And so it just loads again, finds this one, stores, and that store works. And you always have a consistent uh, uh, queue for anyone coming from the outside, right? And so, especially on microcontrollers, this is actually incredibly cheap because they kind of cheated in the implementation. You know, single core Cortex microcontrollers, they don't actually keep track of which address was loaded. They just keep track of whether an interrupt fired. <laughs> And hence, you could have theoretically touched it, <laughs> right? So uh, it's basically a normal load that checks one bit, and it's not a bit slower than anything else, right? So uh, um, I, I highly suggest this pattern for people who want to do their own stunts. Um, I'm almost done on time, so I uh, have another question. Who's, who actually knows why they put this at the beginning of each uh, data sheet? Is it just to show off? And this is not the whole thing. This doesn't really work on slides, so here's the other half. Um, the question I have for you guys, if I have a timer that generates an interrupt when it runs out, and I, I want to do something and I don't want the interrupt to happen, and I turn off this timer by clearing the counter enable bit so it doesn't count anymore. How long after I do that can I still get interrupts? Anyone want to guess? Hmm? Which one? Yeah, Vo Voter knows. I'm, I'm sure Voter will figure it out. So I'm just going to uh, take that away from him. Um, <laughs> that write to the timer register, that lives here. And I put it right there so I can reach it. <laughs> and to get there, it has to go all the way through the bus matrix. And if you look up there, you see the AHB bus matrix, that big a bar up and down, and that one goes down, and if we look at the other sheet, it goes down to this other uh, bus matrix, the APB, and it's actually APP1, and apparently vendors don't have space boards on their keyboards. It's APB1 that can be up to 42 megahertz clock, right? Um, so it could actually take a long time for that turn off bus cycle to actually get to the peripheral. You may, have, you may not be running this APB1 bus at 42 megahertz because maybe you want to save power. You could have clocked it way down. So theoretically, it could be like 100 instruction cycles later that you still get an interrupt, right? And so that's actually why there's a bug on the very first slide, or the, 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 the slide with the, uh, the artist rendition of a chip because they had an arrow between the core and the nested vector interrupt controller. Here they have it right. The NVIC is part of the core, right? It's way up there, just one line away. There's no bus between there, right? And that has to be the case because updates to the interrupt controller are instantaneous and updates to everything else could take long, a long time, right? And for those of you who like to build operating systems that have a pry lock and use base pry, base pry is not always in the core. Some people screwed that up. And so uh, the way to deal with this is there's an, an a similar instruction, DSB. I don't know what it stands for. Probably something terrible because we're engineers and can't name things properly. But data synchronization barrier, yes. And it's a barrier because it just waits until all the buses have clocked out, right? So yeah, that's, uh, that's my talk. You can find me, Odin the Nerd, at all of these things. Uh, who would have thought that that nickname was available at all the, uh, all the different uh, uh, services? Um, I don't know if I have time for questions. 
I think no, uh, we will yeah have time for the questions in the evening. So at the after show party. Thank okay, you very much. Thanks, everybody. Evening.